August 17th meeting of the Westwood School Committee. Oh, sorry. Am I ready to go, John? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. All right, now I'm, gonna, now I'm calling the meeting to order. It's the Tuesday, August 17th um, meeting of the Westwood School Committee. And I will start with the roll call attendance. Uh, Charlie Donahue. Can you unmute yourself? Here. There we go. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Carol Lewis. Here. Tony Mullen. Here. Amanda Phillips. Here. And I am here as well. Um, I'd like to recognize the live stream available online at www.westwood.k12.ma.us slash live to provide real-time public access to the activities of the school committee in accordance with an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. Um, this meeting is also being recorded for later broadcast on Westwood Media Center's platforms. And Connor is here um, helping us with that. So thank you, Connor and the team at Westwood Media Center. All right, I'm going to jump right in. Let's start with the superintendent's report. So I'll turn it over to Emily. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, so just quickly, I wanna let you know it's been a very busy hiring season this summer. We will be welcoming more than 50 new teachers and administrators across the district in the fall, um, in addition to many, many new support staff members as well. Um, you know, we always do quite a bit of hiring in the, in the summer, but I recall, uh, I think it was Tony in July asked if we were experiencing more movement than usual. And I think I can confidently say the answer is yes. Um, so I don't know what to attribute that to, um, but my understanding is that many sectors are experiencing kind of similar changes in staffing patterns. Um, so we'll see how that all plays out. I am happy to report though that um, Western Public Schools continues to attract high quality candidates. And so we're very excited to be having these folks joining us. Um, we have more than 200 students participating in our summer programs between our special education programs and our uh, gen ed programming this year. The programs are still in session for another week or so, and they have been going very well. I want to thank all of the faculty and staff who have been working throughout the summer with our students. Really appreciate their efforts. And uh, one piece of fun news, I'm hoping that you got to see our uh, state championship girls lacrosse team was honored at Fenway Park over the weekend. So that was very exciting. I am hoping to invite them into school committee in September so they can be honored by the school committee as well, which may or may not be more exciting than going to Fenway. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, but that was very nice. Congratulations again to, to them. So um, the bulk of my superintendent's report tonight in terms of school opening logistics, um, of course, has to do with health and safety issues and um, our continuing efforts as we work through some of the challenges presented by COVID. Um, I know that we had all very much hoped that this wouldn't be the case, but um, this is the circumstance we find ourselves in. So let me just say that all of our employee associations have been really wonderful in partnering with us to ensure a smooth opening. And at this point, we don't anticipate the need for any collective bargaining or MOAs. Um, so in terms of what we are working on, um, first, I just wanna say what our goals are here. So the most important thing is to have students learning in person without extended interruptions. And um, I just think it's important to start with that premise. I would say that though there does, does seem to be some disagreement in our community about what steps we should be taking around COVID, I think this is something that we have consensus on, that everyone wants kids to be in school. Um, so that's a good premise to, to work with. I would say that internally, we've also been talking about how do we work our way back to a sense of normal school? Um, and you know what does that look like? And you know, so for me, that means how do we um, work towards getting our students able to work again in groups, to work at lab benches, to sit in circles, uh, you know, in the kindergarten classroom. Um, you know, last year we weren't able to, um, to have lunch at the high school. We'd like to get back to that. We want to restore our full elementary specials. So these are some of the things that we are, we're thinking about. Um, 
I, I do want to be upfront that we can't do all of those things if we are enforcing strict physical distancing guidelines the way that we did last year. Um, pragmatically, we were able to do that last year because we had a different staffing model. We hired a lot more adults. We had different schedules. Um, and so we, I don't think we'll be able to do that kind of distancing with the kind of fidelity that we did last year. So I, I just want to provide that, that context. Um, so with that said, we're really thinking about what to do with the safety of the community in mind. Um, so let me just review what some of the, the mitigation measures were last year, and then I will tell you where we are on each of these things this year. So last year we had um, physical distancing. We began at six feet and we reduced that to three feet in April for grades five to 12. We kept it at six feet for pre-K to four. Um, we had cohorting in place at the elementary and middle school. Uh, we had masking, face coverings. Um, by the end of the year, the policy was indoor only. That was a change. Uh, we worked at improving ventilation in our buildings through a number of measures. We concentrated on frequent hand washing. We required a daily symptom check and required that people stay home if they're symptomatic, both students and staff. We of course had a COVID team that um, did extensive co contact tracing. We had quarantine protocols. We had enhanced cleaning and disinfection practices. Beginning in March, we implemented routine pool testing. And of course, by the end of the year, vaccines were available for, um, for many people. So that was last year. We've been taking a look at the guidance and thinking about this year. So here's what we're working on. First, all of um, our public health partners and um, medical officials have been emphasizing to us that widespread vaccination is the most important mitigation measure available to us as a community. So there seems to be great clarity about that. Um, you know, while vaccination doesn't prevent a person from becoming infected with the virus or passing it on to someone else, um, it does substantially reduce the risk of significant illness requiring hospitalization and the risk of, of death. Um, so that is a key uh, strategy. And the good news is that our vaccination rates in Westwood are, are comparatively high. And I will um, share that information with you during the discussion item. Um, but it's not 100%. There is room for improvement. And so on this first mitigation measure to support the community's vaccination efforts, the district is going to be hosting vaccine clinics. We are working with the Department of Health to bring um, a vaccine clinic out on site. And um, I don't have all of the details nailed down yet, but we think likely the Friday before the Labor Day weekend would be the first opportunity. We'd like to provide multiple opportunities. Um, and so this would be available to students age 12 and up and also to their families. Adults would be welcome as well. Uh, so stay tuned for more information on on that. Uh, secondly, we will continue to provide routine weekly pool testing pre-K to 12 for students whose parents register them for this program. Um, the state has contracted again to be able to provide uh, pool testing free of cost to districts, and so we will participate Unfortunately, uh, when the state went out to bid the contract for this year, they ended up changing vendors. And so though we were partnered with Project Beacon last year, this year um, we will have to be with CIC. And so, um, you know, unfortunately that means that parents will again have to set up an account 
this time through CIC and provide consent again. But we plan to do that through the regular back to school tasks like, you know, emergency contacts and whatnot. So that will be in place. Um, we will continue to use our ventilation strategies. So we will continue with MERV 13 filters and our HVAC systems. We will be changing the filters um, quarterly as we did last year. We will continue to encourage teachers to increase fresh air by opening windows when possible. And we will continue to maximize fresh air through our mechanical HVAC systems and use HEPA filters in spaces without fresh air sources. So that remains in place. We'll continue frequent hand washing and continue to supply hand sanitizers throughout our classrooms. Um, we intend to still require that parents check their students daily for symptoms. And the expectation is if symptomatic that students will stay home and get tested. So that will all remain in place. As I mentioned um, or alluded to before, we have not scheduled this year so that students will be in cohorts. So that's not a strategy in place. And strict physical distancing isn't going to be possible the way that it was last year. We are still working on plans for lunch. Um, I'm, we're just working through a lot of logistics having to do with that. I would say just in general, that our plan is to try to have lunch outdoors as much as possible this year, much like we were doing last spring. Um, we have been trying to get tents for all of our schools. The supply chain for tents now is next to impossible. Um, so we've gotten a couple, but not enough. We're gonna keep working on that. I would say that um, probably the most significant thing that we've been working on has to do with the DPH protocols around contact tracing and um, quarantining. So you may recall that last year, the DPH protocols offered two options to someone who was designated as a close contact to someone with COVID. The first option, and they, they changed over the course of the year, but this is where we were when school got out in June. The first option was to quarantine um, for at least seven days from the date of exposure with an option to test on day five. Or the second option, if somebody chose not to test, was to quarantine for at least 10 days. This year, um, DPH has added another option that they call test and stay. Um, they just rolled this out last Friday to districts. We met yesterday to review it with our medical team and to think it through. The test and stay program is available to districts that opt to participate in the state's testing program. And we've decided that we will offer this option to families this year. Um, it's gonna take some time and resources, but we feel that the test and stay protocol supports our goal of keeping students in school learning as much as possible. And so we think it's an important thing to implement. Um, so I won't get into all the details of it, but under test and stay, here are sort of the highlights. The first thing is that fully vaccinated close contacts are exempt under the new protocols from testing and quarantine response protocols, as long as they remain symptomatic, asymptomatic, sorry, asymptomatic. Um, and so that, um, you know, that's the good news in terms of keeping people in, in school. If you're vaccinated, you, um, if you're asymptomatic, will not have to quarantine if you are a close contact. So test and stay is relevant for unvaccinated close contacts. And for those folks, if they are asymptomatic, then for seven days from the date of exposure, this protocol says that they need to wear a mask and maintain three feet of distance to the degree feasible. And then they would take a rapid antigen test, the BINX now, 
every school day. They're supposed to quarantine on the weekends when they're not here to test. Um, and as long as each day they test negative and remain asymptomatic, they can stay in school that day. And um, then they continue active monitoring for symptoms through day 14. So we're very hopeful that if we can implement that rapid testing daily strategy, that we can prevent um, a lot of kids having to miss school. Um, as I said, we just received those protocols on Friday afternoon. So we're really still working out the details of how we'll implement that. You know, will the test be before school? Will it be at a central location? Um, we also have to work out how to handle school-sponsored weekend activities. The protocol says, for instance, if a student had a game on Saturday, they could be tested on Saturday. We'd have to figure out like who's going to do that testing on Saturday and where. Um, so we are we are thinking all of that through. So those are the things that we are moving forward on. And that, of course, if we go back to our list of mitigation uh, measures, leaves the issue of face coverings, which I know the committee is going to be discussing later on in the agenda. So I will stop there and see if there are any questions. Uh, one question, Emily, I have is uh, for the staff and teachers who are not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any recommendations or actions dealing with them? Yes. So I'm still in the process of um, fully collecting the information about the vaccination status of employees. And I'll, I'll share what I've got um, to date when we get to the discussion item. But the good news is it's very, very high, very high. Um, and so my thinking is that for those employees who are unvaccinated, that we would need them to test um, probably twice a week. Just, um, just to kind of, I just want to maybe reiterate or kind of remind folks of one thing that, I mean, we, the schedule this year will basically be what it used to be in the past. I mean, leave aside the, you know, I know the schedule changed at the middle school, but yeah, I just want to reiterate that basically things are back to normal from a schedule perspective and, you know, it might be mitigation. Is that fair? There might be a few things on lunch. Is that fair? Yeah, everything, the schedule is back to right. what it was. Um, yeah. And so lunch is a thing that presents a challenge and we're trying very hard to sort of hold the line on that. So um one of the things that really facilitated how we did lunch at the elementary last year, because you remember we, we had lunch at elementary all year, is that we were able to do that by spreading kids out into different spaces and um, using some of our specialists to supervise lunch. And the impact of that was that elementary specials, so art, music, PE, library, were shortened to 25 minutes a day. And we really don't wanna do that this year. We really wanna restore those important programs um, so we're trying to prioritize that this year, still mindful of safety. Yeah, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else from anyone? No, is that Emily, is that anything else on the superintendent's report? Uh, that is it for me. Okay. Thank uh, you for what you're doing there. Yeah. Yeah, that was I think the test and stay option is a, is a huge improvement from last year. Um so I'm I'm excited about that and that we're part of the we're we're able to access that through the state. So that's great. It is great. And and actually I'll I'll just add one more thing that um we're you know, we're planning to keep a COVID monitoring and response team in place. Karen Perita's back. Um, Amanda Fairbanks is going to continue as our testing coordinator. So we're we're keeping our um, sort of that additional nursing staffing up this year. Um, those folks were really important. And I think in order to do a test and stay program, we're going to need that kind of infrastructure. Yeah, and we need to thank them for coming back because uh, <laughs> yes. they had a very busy year last year and I we wouldn't did. have blamed them if they didn't want to come back. Sometimes they were the bearer of bad news. <laughs> so, yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, thanks very much to them for coming back. Yes. 
Um, a quick question about the test and stay. <clears throat> Emily, you had mentioned that the expectation is that um, students would quarantine on the weekends. So that obviously means that they wouldn't be participating in sports on the weekends. Is that Well, correct? so I'm telling you what's in the protocol, as it stated, and what it says is that... Um, so the protocol is about school-sponsored activities. It said you, could, you can stay in school on weekdays and you could continue to participate in school-based weekend activities provided that we can provide that testing every day. And um, so, you know, if there were a practice or something at school, but in, you know, I, I, I guess I couldn't weigh in on things like youth sports. The, um, you know, the, the protocol from DPH does say that it, that the expectation is that, that people would quarantine on the weekends. Okay, anything else? All right, um, we are going to move to public participation. Um, I just wanted to make a couple comments. So first, as you can imagine, um, we have received a a large amount of correspondence from a number of people in the community, um, particularly with respect to the masking issue, advocating for both sides of the issue. Um, I wanna thank everyone for their engagement, for their feedback. I want everyone to know that we've ensured that all members of the committee have received all of the correspondence, um, including correspondence that was just sent to the superintendent. She has forwarded it on to us as well. Um, so we have received all of that, we have reviewed all that. Um, I wanna remind people that all comments during public participation should be addressed to the chair, which is me. Um, we have a three minute limit. As you can see, there's a clock on here. So that will let you know how long you have to speak. Um, if you wanna speak, you must be participating in this meeting via Zoom. Um, you cannot, if you are just watching the live stream, you will not be able to participate. I think you could also call in as well. And the instructions are in the agenda on our district website. Um, when you call in, if you can provide your name and your address prior to speaking. Um, I also wanted to let everyone know that we anticipate a fair amount of people tonight to speak. So um, we are going to call people uh, in, you know, in the order that I see them on my screen. Um, no, we will not let people speak twice unless everybody else has gotten a chance to speak at least once. And I do ask that you're mindful um, if you're speaking again, that you're speaking to a different point. We really wanna give everyone an opportunity to speak. Um, our policy is that public comment extent is, it lasts for 30 minutes. If it looks like we're going to extend past 30 minutes, I will entertain a motion from this committee to extend public comment, but we would formally have to extend it by motion. So I think that's it. Um, so I'm going to turn now to the phones and it looks like we have a call from or Tina and Jerry Collins who wish to speak. So Connor, if you could unmute them. Okay, Tina or Jerry, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. This is Tina Collins. Great. I live at 19 Bonnie Street. I'm calling today to advocate for parents' choice when it comes to masking our children. Neither Governor Baker nor DC are recommending a mandate, and if you choose to do so, you will be taking away from our rights to bodily autonomy. The decision to mask or not mask our children should be left entirely up to the parents. School committees, school administrators, and the MTA do not have the authority to make medical decisions for our children. The DPH and CDC cannot pass laws. They make suggestions. This is not law. Requiring someone to wear a mask is a medical intervention. Unless you are a medical professional, you have no authority to recommend such a practice. Many pediatricians and child psychologists have been sounding the alarm and raising serious concerns regarding children's mental and physical health from being forced to wear masks six to eight hours a day. Children are not the ones spreading this virus, nor are they high risk for serious life-threatening cases. They are in the 99.997% survival rate category. There's no scientific data proving that masks stop respiratory illness such as the flu and COVID-19. In fact, if you go to the CDC data on their website from early last spring, you will see that their conclusion after analyzing multiple studies was that there was no evidence that masks were effective in reducing virus transmission when worn by infected persons or by persons in the general community to reduce their susceptibility. Dr. Michael Osterholm, who is a COVID-19 advisor to Biden, 
recently said, wearing masks is largely nonsense and trying to stop a respiratory virus is like trying to stop the wind. The CDC has gone back and forth on this without actually showing any new data. This has become a partisan issue rather than one based on scientific findings. If you plan to go against the governor, DPH, and DC, you must provide to us the scientific data behind your decision. In June, a group of parents sent their children's masks to the Florida State University labs to be analyzed after they wore them to school. The masks that had been freshly cleaned prior to use came back from the lab showing they were loaded with dangerous bacteria, parasites, and fungi. Masks provide a warm, moist environment for bacteria to grow that could potentially end up being more dangerous for the children than COVID-19, from which not one healthy child without an underlying condition has died. A few of the dangerous pathogens found on the masks include tuberculosis, pneumonia, and meningitis. They also found pathogens including fever, those that cause fever, ulcers, acne, strep throat, and yeast infections, to name a few. Masks are more harmful than helpful, both in the bacteria that can grow on it and the likelihood that children will have anxiety and developmental delays, especially at the younger ages. I hope you'll use common sense and scientific data and allow parents to make the choice whether to mask their children or not. Masks are not benign. It is our right to choose. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should let people know I forgot to mention that if you want to participate, you need to push the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen um, and that will put you in the queue. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, next, we have Justin Obey. So Connor, if you could mute him, I mean, unmute him. Hi, um, I think you can hear me, but. Um, yeah, go ahead. My name is Justin Obey, 34 Briarwood Drive, Westwood. Um, grew up in town, actually chose to move back, um, both um, Superintendent Parks and Ms. Borchers. I had the pleasure of uh, having them, you know, run our school basically. And uh, we chose to move back because they were like, you know, Westwood's the best schools around. Um, I appreciate what you've all done and continue to do in keeping our schools safe. Um, I would like to completely, uh, support what Tina Collins just said. Um, we, we are, myself and my wife are very adamant against masks and uh, mandating of masks for, for basically everything that Tina said. I won't, can, I won't repeat exactly what she said. I had that all prepared as well. Um, I, would, I would encourage you all to, if you do choose to mandate masks this year, um, ask that you do provide scientific evidence that this is not harming our ch children for the future. Because I don't think there's any reason, rational reason based on the data that's presented uh, by the CDC that prove that masks are safe and effective in preventing COVID. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Kara Buckley. Can you hear me? We can. Connor, if you could reset the clock. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so first, I just want to thank everyone that's in this meeting, because I know this has been uh, over a year of tireless work, you know, working to help make the right choices. And I know this is emotionally laden and difficult. So I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the diligence and the extra time that you've all put into this over the past year and a half. I think that should be recognized. Um, I actually want to share a contrary point to the two points that were just shared. And if you're looking for scientific information, I would refer directly to the American Academy of Pediatricians, who, who recommend wearing masks indoors to help protect our children from uh, COVID infections. I also want to point people to the fact that the CDC has recently issued some new data points that have indicated that 400 kids have died from COVID in recent months as schools have reopened around the nation and 2,000 kids are hospitalized from the disease, including most of those in the ICU. So I really do think that we are facing a grave situation with the Delta variant in particular. And I think that situation necessitates the use of masks. And I really think that when it comes to safety, it should not be a choice. If you want the benefit of attending our schools, you have the responsibility to keep the community around you safe. And I think the data is striking and the data is being uh, shared by leading authorities. I've actually had the benefit of um, working for a Fortune 50 company every step of the way on this, making operational choices. And I know a lot about this in terms of the role of ventilation, the role of spacing, 
And I can tell you with certainty that every mitigation measure that you can put in place to keep our kids safe and our broader community safe is justified and warranted. And, uh, you know, masks, the kids were wearing them for a year. They grew accustomed to them. Kids are resilient. There's no proven data that shows that masks are harming kids. And in fact, there's a lot of proven data that, that indicates that masks will help prevent the spread of the virus. And all of this must be taken into account. What also must be taken into account is the point that um, Superintendent Parks made at the beginning of this. Even setting aside the debate on the role that masks play in terms of children's safety, there is the factor of disruption. And as someone who's been instrumentally involved in trying to keep a 24 hour business running throughout the pandemic, and we were deemed an essential business, I can tell you that disruption will happen left and right if these kids are spaced three feet apart and they're not wearing masks, right? Because inherently you will have more cases, which will mean more kids on quarantine. And I understand that, you know, that Superintendent Parks has shared some of these new methods, but to me, that actually underscores the criticality of mask wearing because you're going to have kids who are asymptomatic who could potentially still be spreading this thing in schools. Um, and in addition to that, there are going to be kids that are symptomatic. So what happens to those kids when they're on quarantine? They will not have the ability to continue learning. So I really believe um, in summary, again, safety should not be optional. We should all be doing our part because when you wear a mask, you are not just protecting yourself, you are protecting those around you. And that should be something that we all step up to do in our community. Great, thank you. Um, next up, we have Henry D'Angelo. If you could unmute him. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, I, I just wanted to let people know that I'm here. I, I'm. I'm Oh. Many people don't know me. I'm, I'm, I've been the school doctor, the town doctor, actually both two separate positions uh, <laughs> for about 20 years now and has been, have been an advisor. So I just wanted to say I'm here as you need me if there are factual points people want clarification on or if you want me to speak at the end. So uh, I, I want to give everybody else that time. Great. Thank you, Henry. Um, Next up, we have Wail Assad. Wail Assad. Apologies if I mispronounced it. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Um, thanks you for all the work that you guys are doing on this, you know, complicated topic and you know, obviously very contentious. I just wanted to speak. You Sorry. Know, I, could you just give us your your name and your address? Sorry. Sure. So uh, my name is Wail Assad. I live at um, in, on Fox Meadow in Westwood. Perfect. Thank um, you. So. Um, you know, just speaking both as, as a as a doctor and as a as a neuroscientist, you know, I wanted to address a couple of points. Um, number one, that you know, there's a lot of evidence that Delta is a much more significant virus and uh, with much greater risk than we've experienced before with the original variant, and I think that needs to be keeping kept in mind with respect to potential risks to the children. Um, number two, I think that regarding the efficacy of masks, there are no good randomized controlled trials that really answer the question definitively, but there are a lot of epidemiological studies that have been done that suggest that mask wearing has had an effect. And in addition, there are good studies looking at the effect of masks to reduce the viral load, especially in cases where you're not saturated with the virus in the air, where they do have a significant effect at reducing the probability of transmission, in, in addition to using other mitigation efforts, such as ventilation and things like that. All these things are pretty well established. And then with regard to the potential downsides of masks, you know, I think that there are a, a couple of possible categories. One is the category that, you know, does it affect the children psychologically? Number two, is it harmful, you know, in terms of collecting bacteria and things like that? To the latter question, I would say, you know, we wear masks in the hospital all the time and, you know, that sort of thing does not happen. And, you know, we don't worry about, you know, as, as long as you're wearing clean masks and you're keeping them clean, it's, you know, there isn't a, an epidemic of, you know, doctors wearing masks all day and nurses and, you know, getting fungal and respiratory infections and things like that. That's, that's not a real concern. With regard to the children, you know, there are, there is evidence that children, especially those younger than five, will see, you know, will have a harder time recognizing emotion. Um, you know, when people are wearing masks and, you know, we've all had the experience of not recognizing faces as easily when people are wearing masks. Yet older children certainly are able to do it. And then there's this concept of critical periods, like is it going to affect their development? And I don't think that children who you know, have to wear a mask and encounter other people wearing a mask for a few hours a day, five days a week, you know, it's really going to affect their development. We have a child who's you know, seven in the schools here. I'm not at all worried about her you know, neurocognitive development in the setting of, of wearing masks. I just don't think that's a reasonable concern from a neuroscientific point of view. 
So I think overall, the you know you're always assessing you know medical interventions on the basis of risk versus benefit. I think there's a real risk, even if small, it's a real risk. We don't want even one child in our community to get seriously ill and potentially die. And it's a it's a minimal intervention, you know, that has really low risks in terms of the intervention itself. So I would be strongly in favor of masks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Heather Morrison. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Hi, Heather Morrison. I'm at 74 Magnolia Drive. Um, I am a school administrator who works in a residential and day program for kids with special needs who have a difficult time wearing masks, I should say, um, and am the leader of our COVID team. So I'm also very um, knowledgeable about all of this subject, was on Desi's call last week, so I'm very aware of the details. Um, I understand, you know, first of all, I thank everybody for their hard work. I know that we do not expect to be here a year later and still having these discussions. Um, I know it's difficult for the teachers, the administrators, the school committee, the parents, um, and most importantly, the kids. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear about so many things going back to normal. I think that's really great and wonderful to hear that, you know, the distancing and specials are back and the schedule's back to normal and all of that. So thank you very much for following that guidance. Um, in general, I am in support of all of the DESE guidance that was issued for the 21-22 school year. While it is not perfect, it's a detailed plan that focuses on keeping kids in school, keeping staff and students healthy, and has the support of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. The state has consulted with experts and determined that given that Massachusetts has one of the highest vaccination rates in the country, we are well protected. Because of our high vaccination rate, we have the eighth lowest rate of COVID cases in the country and the third lowest per capita capital hospitalization rate. As stated by Governor Baker yesterday, the fact that so many people in Massachusetts have been vaccinated has put us in a dramatically different place than many other states across this country. The experts in Massachusetts have spoken and provided you with a plan to follow. It includes a robust testing program with a recommendation for masks for unvaccinated individuals and allows for vaccinated individuals to go unmasked. There is no reason for Westwood to go above and beyond this guidance and issue a mask mandate for all staff and students. I ask that you please consider the following facts. Massachusetts and Westwood are well vaccinated. Norfolk County has over 84% of its residents 12 and up with at least one dose. Westwood has similar numbers and I know you're gonna review them later, but the kids numbers are even better than that, 88 and 95% and above. Children are at very low risk for hospitalization and death, even with Delta. The kids that are dying are kids that have pre-existing conditions. A child between the ages of five and 14 is 10 times more likely to die in a car accident or twice as likely to die in the flu, but we never had these restrictive measures for the flu, nor do we stop driving cars. Children are not super spreaders. We saw that last year, especially in classrooms. Schools were very safe. Um, and many countries such as Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, Netherlands have had no mask mandates throughout and have been very successful. Cloth masks are minimally effective and only under perfect circumstances like the doctor just mentioned where you're changing them in between patients. That's not how our children wear them. They make it difficult for students and teachers to hear each other and they can't full, and we don't fully understand the harm that they are doing to children. I'll wrap it up now. Um, I just, I hope that you adopt the evidence-based DESE protocols for Westwood Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carlo Rosen. All right, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, I'm at uh, 180 Partridge Drive. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a physician, I'm an emergency physician. I've been working uh, you know, on the front lines taking care of COVID patients since day one. Um, I do think that a uh, couple points I'd make is, first of all, there's actually very good scientific and medical evidence that masks do work. Uh, first of all, there's actually a great study out of Mass General Brigham, uh, you know, in town that shows that among healthcare workers who've clearly been on the front lines, clearly on a daily and hourly basis are exposed to COVID, the infection rate is actually very low. Um, based on things like wearing a mask and also on social distancing uh, when, when not able to wear a mask, you know, for instance, in break rooms and things like that. So actually, you know, in the healthcare field, uh, masking has been proven to decrease infection rates. 
Uh, we also have a lot of experience. There's, there's some studies out of uh, North Carolina looking at children as well and, and showing that basically when you wear masks, even if you do have COVID exposure uh, in the school system, the child to child transmission is very low. Uh, and that's in North Carolina, that's published data as well. So I would agree that, you know, we really should rely on, on things like the AAP, um, the American Association of Pediatrics, and what sort of, uh, sort of uh, science and, and medicine are teaching us about how uh, effective masks are. Uh, the argument that there's fungi and bacteria on, on masks uh, makes no medical sense. Um, obviously, surgeons and physicians have been wearing masks for over hundreds of years uh, safely. Um, you have fungi and bacteria on your iPhone, um, and it has no, um, you know, uh, pathologic effect on you. Um, and so not really anything to worry about. I think the goal is to keep kids in school. If kids are not wearing masks, you will have spread of COVID. You will have to uh, quarantine people, and they're going to be out of school when that's happening. The other thing we haven't talked about is that there are long COVID syndromes in children. And so you have to worry about even kids that don't have severe illness, having symptoms for five weeks or more. And these symptoms are things like headache, cognitive issues, can't focus at school, have to stay home, again, are gonna miss school as a result of getting COVID, even if you're not dying or in the ICU. So I really think we have to be thoughtful again about the community. We have to decrease community spread and do our best to end this disease. Thank you. Um, our next caller is Joanna French. Hi, my name is Joanna French. I live at 3 Cranston Avenue. Um, I begin my remarks by um, stating that I have worked on the policy and planning committee for MIT for the last 18 months, talking and setting policy around uh, M, uh, COVID, poli um, COVID policy on campus in order to keep our campus safe and open. Uh, I just wanna put out there that um, we believe in a three layer approach to keeping our community, our MIT community safe. We are depending on a high vaccination rate, which I am looking forward to hearing the numbers. Unfortunately, with vaccines not being available for those under 12, we won't have 100% or 98% vaccine um, compliance on, in our school systems. So we will have to use other mitigating factors. The other way that MIT is preventing the spread of COVID on campus is by having a mandatory mask um, policy um, in all indoor buildings for everybody vaccinated or not. And the third way is having regular testing. So I'm also very pleased to see that we're continuing the pool, the pool testing and having ongoing testing for those who are um, uh, who are have been exposed. So I want to just give my appreciation to the committee for all their hard work over the last 18 months. I hear you. I have been in it with you um, just at the higher ed level, and it has been exhausting. And I'm sure you're all very tired too. Um, but at the end of the day, I really want to just put out my support for having mandatory masks in school. They work. They are a layer of protection. They're an important layer of protection, especially when so many in our community cannot be vaccinated yet. So this is not about, um, safety is not a choice. We have the expectation that we are sending our children to a safe environment. Masks are an important part of that um, safety protocol. And um, I, I thank you for your time tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann Miller. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marion Miller. I'm at 27 Hooper Street, and I'm calling to advocate against masks. Um, as a parent of an elementary student, I, I'm trying to judge the best response for her, for her program, for her classes. And I was just very, very aware of all the, the challenges that that posed last year. Um, it interfered with, um, you know, communication in the class. It interfered with a lot of the other things that she was doing. And I've, I've been trying to stay on top of the numbers, um, studying a lot about this, trying to read as much as I could. And I would just want to point out 
that there was an AAP article that was published just last week. And as of August 12th, the total number of students who are children who have died under the age of 18 since the start of COVID is 378. So there is not a rapid rise in students who are getting and spreading and dying of COVID right now. Um, and I just think that the, the balance of this, we're, I mean, we're not talking about N95 masks. We're not talking about students are not doctors or anybody who knows how to wear a mask and wear it safely. And they put it in their pocket when they're outside at recess, it falls on the ground. There, there's all kinds of other factors involved. And, and we don't have that kind of oversight of the students in elementary schools, especially. Um, and so I, I just think it's really important to keep it in perspective that the focus here is learning, it's educating our students, and, and they are the least at risk of, of all of the age groups that are out there. And I think that's just very important to keep that in perspective. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, I don't see anybody else in the queue. Oh, wait, uh, Megan Flaherty. Oh, Megan, I think if you unmute yourself, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Megan Flaherty. I'm at 188 School Street, and I really appreciate everybody's perspectives on masking. And I appreciate all the work that you all have been doing with this. One thing that we haven't considered in many of the arguments is that we have a lot of children who are vulnerable with their health, um, including mine. And if they were to get sick um, with COVID, it might be devastating for those families who have kids with health conditions. So I appreciate that many folks are speaking about their children who may be healthy and not have pre-existing conditions, but in service of those in the community who do have pre-existing conditions, we need to think about our whole community. And for that reason, I believe that we should continue with masking, especially for those kids who cannot be vaccinated and who are in situations in school where they are with other kids who cannot be vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Karen Albers. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Karen Albers. I'm at 105 Edgewood Road in Westwood. Um, my kids were actually fully remote last year and my, the teachers did a fabulous job, but I am so excited for them to be able to go back into the classroom this year. I just cannot wait. Um, I'm thrilled. And I hope that with that, um, we can continue to have the safety measures that we had last year, which were fabulous that you did great. And I understand that we want to have closer proximity. And I think that's, I understand that and the testing and that's fine too. But I do ask that um, you consider the mask mandate. My kids have been able to stay healthy. My family has been able to stay healthy. And I hope that that can continue. Um, one thing I did want to mention is just that there has been some discussion about the DESE um, guidance about not having masks. And actually, I just wanted to clarify the DESE guidance and the Department of Public Health actually recommends that all unvaccinated staff and unvaccinated students in grade seven and above wear masks indoors. So for those who are arguing that we don't need masks for our kids, the actual guidance says that those who are unvaccinated should wear masks. So in, if we're asking that instead that we let them um, wear a mask or not wear a mask, then we're going to have to have the teachers trying to monitor which kids are vaccinated, which kids are not vaccinated. You're going to have to have proof of vaccination to understand who is and who should not be wearing a mask. So I just wanted to say that with the increase in the number of cases, we're at the highest level of kids being sick right now um, with COVID and with the hope that we can all get back to the classroom, be closer together, um, have a little more normalcy this year. I would ask that you please consider the concerns of community spread and for the people who cannot be vaccinated right now and include a mandatory mask guidance. And again, I would thank you so much for everything you did last year and again for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Brian. Um, I don't see a last name. So Brian, I just asked for your name and address. 
and you should be able to unmute yourself. Brian, you there? Um, maybe Connor will come back to Brian. I don't, I, he's, he doesn't seem to be unmuted. Sure. I also sent him a ping to unmute himself as well. And there okay. was no response. So I'll disable okay. the talking, but we can do the hand raise up. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, at this time, I do note that we're at the 30 minute mark. So I will entertain a motion to extend um, public participation from any member of the, of the committee. Yeah, I'll make that motion with a caveat that um, I see four people plus Brian in the queue. I'd like to limit it to the, anyone who's already raised their hand. Nobody further than that at this point. Okay. I would second that. Okay, I'll do a roll call. Charlie? Yes. Carol? Yes. Tony? Yes. Amanda? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will limit this to people who haven't spoken and will extend um, public participation. So next up is Danielle Dwyer. Hi, this is Danielle Kaplan. I live at 96 Skyline Drive. Um, I have three kids in elementary school in Westwood. Um, and I, I want to second what everyone else has said about uh, what a wonderful job the school system did last year. The, uh, the district was amazing. And so thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, I'm also a cr critical care attending um, physician at Boston Children's and I work in our pediatric ICU with um, an incredibly vulnerable population of kids, many of whom have um, been really affected by COVID this year, both um, by the virus itself and by kind of the limitations that they faced in um, being able to access healthcare this past year um, during the pandemic and during the quarantine. Um, I think, I don't, I'm not gonna reiterate what others have said in terms of the evidence behind masking, but I think that there's, there's plenty of evidence out there to support it in kids. Um, I think Delta is also um, is something that makes me feel um, kind of more worried for my kids than I felt last year. It just seems like there's more unknown. Um, and so um, as a physician and as a mom in town, I would just strongly advocate to consider um, universal masking for all the kids, or at least for all of the unvaccinated kids in the elementary schools this year. Great, thank you. Um, next, we have Jared Jones. Uh, yes, I uh, just wanted to say sorry. that- Jared, could you give us your full oh, name and your address? Of course, I'm sorry. Jared Jones, 10 Adams Street. Um, I have a son uh, who is autistic, who is in the peer program, who's in ESY. Um, despite wearing masks and everything, um, he received all his services and made notable gains this past year. So even with masks, it does work. I think we are all tired of it. No one wants to go and put on a mask as they leave. Parents are tired of washing them. Do you have it? Where is it? Are you keeping it clean? We all get the fatigue is very real, but I think we also have to remind ourselves and our kids that the mask we wear is not for us, it's for someone else. Um, because it only is useful if everyone is wearing a mask. Um, and so I'm grateful for the efforts that you all have made and continue to make. And you know, regardless of what is the decision, I'm pretty sure that you know my kids will be wearing masks when they go to school September 1st. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next, we have Miriam, and apologies if I get this wrong, Yegenegi. Yes, Yegenegi, thank you. Um, I, my name is Miriam Yegenegi and I work in, and I live in 38th Storo Circle. Uh, I'm also a physician and we recently moved to Westwood because of the school system at Westwood. And I wanna first thank you for tirelessly working on this issue and a lot of other issues that concern our kids. As I mentioned, I'm a physician um, and I've been at the forefront working with the COVID patients. Um, I've been working with the COVID 
uh, even neonates. Uh, so um, I, I really see that. And as you um, have noticed, most of the physicians that have spoken tonight who are up to date with the most recent uh, scientific data um, are also um, uh, advocating for mask use um, because of the, uh, def the Delta variant that is ramping through the community and we have seen the effect of that on uh, in florida and some of the states in the south that's really um uh, limiting uh, attendance of the even if the kids don't sick get sick um they are they can't attend the school and they need to quarantine um so that will really limit their presence in school and also we know that data suggests that the delta variant is making the kids really sick and i'm part of a community of uh, physicians working on COVID and the pediatricians continuously say that even in Massachusetts, they do have admissions on a daily basis of COVID uh, pediatric patients, even the healthy uh, population uh, with COVID, and a lot of them end up in ICU. Um, so as a parent of, of someone who uh, cannot be vaccinated, um, and, uh, you know, especially in elementary school and middle school, I really advocate for uh, masking until they can become uh, vaccinated. And I think this is... Uh, when safety comes to play, this is really not a choice. It becomes for the safety of even one kid around us, we should, we should really advocate for masking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go back to Brian. All right, is this working now? There we go, we got you. All right, great. Uh, Thea, thank you for helping me set that up. Yeah, so I'll just keep this brief because I know this Sorry. has been a lot of people. Brian, can you just give me a, your full name and your address? Oh, sure. Uh, my name's Brian Gorman, and I live at 145 School Street. Um, I have a master's in public health and epidemiology. And uh, I'm just going to keep it brief because there was a lot of points already made. I support the mask mandate, mandate, particularly since social distancing will not be implemented. The masks worked yet last year. I kept our kids in school, and it was great. Uh, this Delta variant is no joke, and the numbers uh, continue to escalate at the worst possible time. Um, so, especially since the elementary school is not vaccinated, all those folks do not have the opportunity. Um, so we should follow those, um, those national recommendations um, of the masking. Our goal is to keep the kids in school uh, and to do it safely and to decrease the community spread because we, we also don't wanna forget about the community at large. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I don't see anybody else in the queue. So, oh, are there any call-ins, Connor? Um, no, you would see the call-ins in the same location. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, actually, there's one person, um, and again, apologies if I get the name wrong, Gang Jiang. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, this is Gang Xiong. I live in 26 North Street. Uh, so um, uh, last year, my son is in the phony remote school, in the web school. Uh, it works pretty well. And also, I know many parents, they uh, also, the kids are also in this school and they work pretty well and they made, made a, uh, a great progress for, uh, for last year. Uh, so um, I admit that there's, there's many, uh, for many different families, they may have a different comfort level with this uh, COVID-19. Um, so we have many options for last year, like the phony remote school and the in-person you can choose. But for this coming school year, uh, I think there's no uh, phone remote options for, for, the school, for any students. Um, so I'm wondering, so I, I mean, um, of course this may cause a lot more efforts for the school community, um, but at least can we do some kind of um, pro survey to say how many students they need this option and can, if there's sufficient uh, students want this uh, option, can we make it available? Uh, so uh, that's what I want to say, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Sandra Yoon. Hello, um, this is Sandra Yoon. I live on Brookfield Road. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity and for all of your work. Um, people have said a lot of things that I won't repeat. Um, I'm in support of masking um, for our students and our staff in the school district. Um, I just had a thought about the, um, the test and stay strategy. Um, I had a chance to look at it and 
I spent some time going through like the CDC websites and through all the guidance, there's so many nuances that if you don't read the fine print, you're going to miss something. It's so complicated. Um, and one thing I realized was that with the test and stay strategy, it all depends on identifying who your close contact is. And that close contact definition changes based on duration, distance, and masking. And the CDC, um, it says that the criteria for if you're in the three to six foot window, as long as both parties are appropriately and adequately and consistently masked. So if you have optional masking or intermittent masking and you're asking a child to go back two days to say, what were you doing at two o'clock and who were you talking to and did you have your mask on and were you three feet apart or were you four feet apart? I, I think you're gonna make it too complicated. Um, or if you're not really paying attention to those things because you just see it as it's three feet in the school system, that's a close contact. Um, I just feel like not having universal masking is going to make the test and stay strategy that's been very thoughtful. Um, it's going to challenge it. Um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Um, so it looks like we have Henry D'Angelo in the queue. I know that he spoke before, but he didn't really give a public comment. He just introduced himself. So I'm going to, oh wait, no, nope, he went away. So maybe he's not, um, no, nope, he's back. All right, Henry, um, I'm gonna let you speak again because you didn't really oh. speak the first time. So. Okay, you know, I, I only, so I'm speaking, uh, Henry D'Angelo, I'm not a Westwood resident, so I'm the school doctor and, you know, please, feel free to cut me off or tell me to stop if I'm speaking inappropriately, but just, I wanted to, uh, you know, taking my prerogative as school physician to feel, to summarize a little bit, both the work of the committee and the work here. I think it's striking that I believe there were five docs who spoke in a, in a uh, master's in public health or doctor in public health, uh, unequivocally advocating for a mask mandate. I have to say, in medical circles at, at MGB, where I, I'm chair of family medicine, this is not a controversial point. This is not something that we would consider controversial. This would be, you know, I hate to say it, but this, this would be considered clearly the way to go given the increasing rates with Delta. Um, as far as mask efficacy, the CDC website does now have 15 studies among many others showing efficacy of uh, mask wearing. Um, if you're more into anecdote, uh, I think the healthcare community is clearly the anecdote to look to. Uh, we've been wearing uh, masks since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, healthcare workers were getting COVID. As soon as universal masking was implemented, healthcare workers started getting COVID in rates lower than the background community. And that includes people working in COVID units, COVID ICUs and ERs. Again, there is no debate among infectious disease doctors, uh, epidemiologists that masks make a difference. I, I don't think this is a close call. You know, that would be my opinion as the town doctor. That would be the opinion to the uh, parents that came into my office. Um, and that was the uh, overwhelming uh, uh, sentiment of the people on the COVID task force. Um, this obviously can be revisited. Right now we are in a time of increasing rate. We are worse off than we were six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. There is reasonable hope that things will be much better in two, four, six weeks. And this could be revisited on a dime. Uh, but my strong recommendation as the town and school physician would be to implement the mask mandate. Thank you. So, Thank you, Henry. Um, Okay, I don't see anyone else in the queue. So at this time, I am going to end public participation uh, and we are going to move on to the school committee chair update and liaison reports. Um, I can give a really quick school building project update. Uh, this is the Hanlon Deerfield proposed new elementary school on the Hanlon site. Uh, we are almost through design development uh, as we, we did an 
A rough estimate when we were 50% through, we found ourselves still on budget, which is great given the increasing costs in construction. So that was really good news for the project. Um, next steps are to finish up design development and then move to the ta special town meeting, which is scheduled for October 18th, Monday, October 18th, um, followed by a special ballot on Tuesday, October 26th. Um, if the project is passed at both of those, the town meeting and the special ballot, then this project will move into construction development um, and actually move forward. So a couple of important dates coming up um, and that's really it for the building project. If anyone has any questions? Nope. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony for the COVID-19 advisory group update. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to keep this pretty short because I think we'll be talking about some of this in a few minutes. Um, so just a brief update from the COVID-19 advisory. You know, I think first of all, um, you know, I'd like to echo what, they, what the superintendent said, they recommended continuing many of the successful strategies like ventilation, testing, hand washing, et cetera, that the superintendent um, outlined last year, you know, it was successful. Um, so that was kind of, I think a first thing that's come out of that group. Um, and we'll talk about vaccination a bit. You know, the, you know, overall, obviously, we're encouraged by, you know, data in the East and Westwood that is certainly better than the national and even better than, you know, Massachusetts data. We still have a little ways to go. Um, we'd love to get those numbers up, um, especially among our kind of 12 to 18 year olds. Um, but I think they continue, you know, I think it's good data. They continue, um, I think as the superintendent mentioned, to recommend, um, vac you know, vaccination obviously is a great way um, to protect health, even with Delta, you know, there's been a lot of stuff about Delta. It may, you know, it may not be the 94% um, that we saw back in the, the trials back uh, nine months ago, but certainly um, the CDC data can, indicates that it, the vaccination is still extremely effective against infection, of course, um, other um, worse outcomes like hospitalizations. Um, the third thing I'll say is, you know, I think, you know, there was really no conversation, you know, around kind of 12 and under around face masks. Um, I think that echoes the DESI guidance and everything else um, The you know, for right now, 12 and under is not able to get vaccinated. That will likely change in a few months. Um, but I think there was a, you know, no real discussion. Um, I think Henry talked about a little bit, um, really no discussion there because they're all unvaccinated. So continued face masks um, in for the immediate um, indefinitely until the, the vaccination status changes. There was more conversation, I would say around um, seventh grade and above or 12 and over however you cut it. Um, I think where, you know, a lot of the discussion as we landed was, you know, as we've heard, obviously things even compared to six weeks ago or certainly compared to where we were in May and June um, with the Delta variant has made transmission um, increase quite a bit. Um, notably, if you follow um, the CDC kind of um, community transition metric, um, they do kind of a metric based on incidence and positivity and they do it at a county level. Um, Norfolk County has now gone up to the category substantial, which is kind of the third. I mean, there's a, one higher category. Some counties in Massachusetts have gone up to high. Um, so that has actually, you know, neg you know that's, that's moved there as of a few weeks ago. Um, so that's something I think definitely a data point that kind of this, the committee took into effect that now Norfolk County and Westwood is actually a little worse the last couple of weeks in Norfolk County um, is on incidents per 100,000. So definitely the trend has not been unfortunate in going the right direction. Um, and then I think you've heard a lot about, I'm not gonna get into the, the research. I think you've heard a lot from the different people and the participants around some of the epidemiology and another research that shows that, you know, face masks can both protect the wearer um, from getting COVID as well as if someone has COVID can actually protect um, others um, from getting infected from someone if they are, um, are shedding COVID. Um, so I guess given where that we're at, I think the, the guidance of the, medical task force is that we start the year um, fully um, that you know, requiring face masks for all ages and all grades um, is kind of a, is the overall, I guess, guidance that we're hearing from that group. Um, and I think the second piece though, is we've had these conversations, they also um, acknowledge that, you know, that we hope, um, and I think Henry talked a little about this, we hope we'll get on the other side um, and get back to between vaccinations and getting over this, we'll get back to hopefully where we were even um, in you know May and June. Um, so the other guidance, and we can talk about this as committee, is that not today, but in the future, we actually establish some metrics um, that can actually would guide um, kind of the um, turning, if you want to call it the turning on of the mass policy, particularly among vaccinated individuals, that we develop some metrics. And, and those metrics, I don't think 
will be actually, you know, we can probably just leverage what the CDC has come out with something around the transmission and or um, and or potentially the vaccination rate. Um, but we don't have to decide that today. But I think, you know, I think the desire, obviously, I think of everyone, um, you know, while we acknowledge today we, the mass, you know, hopefully there will be a day um, in our lifetimes um, where we won't have to wear masks. So that's kind of, I think, the broad summary. And we can talk more about this when we get to the conversation on masks and the, and the action items. Okay, thanks, Tony. So just to kind of sum up, it seems like there's two points coming out of there. The first is that the COVID advisory team recommends universal masking at this time, but secondly, also recommends that the committee put in place metrics so that there comes a period where we can say, okay, you know, we're going to modify that and move move off of it and only unvaccinated or whatever the metrics yeah, says. Yeah, whatever the case. Fair enough. Okay. Yes, I think that's correct. Okay. Um, are there any questions for Tony? No? Okay. Um, we are moving on. Oh, are there any other liaison reports that anyone wants to provide? No. Okay. So we're moving on to the discussion item. We have one item tonight and it is the face covering policy that we've talked about. Um, I just want to remind everybody that our current policy that's in effect is universal masking, right? So if you're in the school, if you're indoors in school, um, you need to be masked. Our, this is the policy we put in place last year. We haven't changed it. So that current is the current policy. To the extent we want to modify that, that's what this discussion is about. Um, but right now, that's the policy that we have in place that's been carried over since last June. So uh, we, the committee, had asked Emily to pull together some information uh, regarding this for this discussion item. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily as she presents that information. Right, can you see my screen? Oops. Yep, we're good to go. Okay, great, except I'm not on the first <laughs> slide, sorry. You're giving us a preview. A preview, yes. <laughs> All right, so um, you would ask for some information. And so first I am just sharing with you, these are the graphs that we had been looking at every month all last year. Um, and so this information comes from DPH's weekly COVID report for Westwood. Um, and um, we now have a year's worth of data. So you can see that um, COVID rates were nothing at some point in July here in Westwood and that they have um, ticked back up since our meeting in July. Um, and this gives you a sense of sort of where we are. Um, you know, you can compare it to other points in the year that we've experienced. Um, similarly, this is just the average daily incidence rate. And so you can see the curve uh, follows along with the case rates and then the percent positivity. So um, this is as of last Thursday's report, the percent positivity had gone back over uh, 2% after being down at zero in mid-July. Um, I got some information from Margaret Sullivan, who is Westwood's public health nurse yesterday. And this is what she reports that in the last two week period between August 1st and August 13th, there have been 27 new cases of COVID in Westwood. Of those 27, 12 of the individuals were unvaccinated and 15 were vaccinated. Um, of the 12 unvaccinated, five were under the age of 12, and so they were unvaccinated and ineligible to be vaccinated. Just um, some information, our experience in our summer program. So we had 181 students participating in ESY. As Maya mentioned, the max mask policy of universal masking is still in effect. And so masks continued to be required this summer. Our pool testing continued, though I think um, what Amanda Fairbanks told me, it was, it was about 20% of people who were participating in the pool testing at any one time, but all of our pools were negative. We did unfortunately have a case of a positive staff member and um, some close contacts who needed to quarantine as a result and a student close contact did subsequently turn positive. We do think that that likely was an example of in-school transmission. So um, you asked for some information about vaccination rates. Um, you know, I, I think when we think about what's different this August from last August, obviously the fact that 
we have people who are vaccinated is very different. As we heard during public comment, um, a lot of our medical advisors have been talking about the Delta variant as well, though. Um, so this is just a um, little screenshot, the source of the CDC that um, illustrates the Delta variant has a much higher transmission rate than what we were dealing with last year. Um, and that certainly was a, a big part of the conversation um, with um, our advisory group. And meet. So that's the bad news. The good news is that vaccines do still provide a high level of protection from Delta. Um, and so certainly being vaccinated, as we know, does um, greatly reduce the likelihood of hospitalization or, or death, um, as this, this graph does indicate. In terms of our vaccination rates, so we're in the process of getting this information from our staff. We um, have been able to collect that from about 95% of our employees. It's hard to track some folks down over the summer. So we are still trying to locate about 5% of those people. Um, but the good news is that of those who have responded, 97% of our employees are fully vaccinated. Um, we have an additional about 1% who will be vaccinated fully by the time school starts. And we have about 2% of our employees who report that they do not intend to be vaccinated. This is a look at our community vaccination rates. Again, this is pulled from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health um, public report. It is as of August 12th. And um, so you can see that um, we are doing fairly well in terms of our vaccination rates in Westwood, which is certainly um, very encouraging news. DPH reports vaccination rates by um, age bands here. And I've also provided comp data so that you can see how Westwood compares to other communities in Norfolk County and in Massachusetts. And you can see on the left, we have the rates for fully vaccinated. And then over here on the right, the rates for um, folks who have had at least one dose. We were interested in taking a look at our vaccination rates by grade, not just by age band. That age band of 12 to 15 is tough for us because of course it straddles two different schools, the middle school and the high school. And that age band of 16 to 19 includes um, many, many people who are actually college students and aren't in our schools. And so um, one of our school nurses disaggregated this data for us. And when we look at it this way, you can see that our vaccination rates for students seem a little bit lower than when we sort of first look at those age bands. Um, I think this could be due to a, a number of factors. Um, our school physician does tell us that the data in MIIS is likely lagging a little bit behind reality, so they may be slightly deflated. Um, you can also see in this column here that um, it is possible for parents to opt out having their students' vaccination status in the, um, in the state public health portal. And so we do have about maybe 3% of students whose status we don't know. Um, so they could be vaccinated, but we aren't aware of that. Um, and um, we also um, in this number are re removing private school students, for example, which might in, uh, change our, um, our percentage in some way. And as I mentioned, those college students, um, most of whom I think are required to be vaccinated to go to school, maybe sort of inflating the number for that 16 to 19 year old band. Um, so this is where we are at this point. We can see by grade and then also um, we then broke it out by school. The middle school of course includes grade six, none of whom are eligible to be vaccinated. Um, and there are some students in grade seven also who aren't old enough to be vaccinated, a relatively small number. Emily, could you bring back the, the charts that show the COVID over the numbers of months with the, the bar graphs? Sure. Uh, this one? Yeah, there's there's three of them, including the positivity. And yeah. the, the concern I have is we've been at this a long time. Uh, and the little increases we're seeing here in July and August 
it's almost like a, a different disease from what we've been told. This is the Delta thing, which is much more explosive uh, spreading and much more serious uh, uh, results. Now, we're in good shape in that we've had a lot of vaccinations and all of that, but it's a little disturbing, you know, to see this information. You know, I, I kind of figure because we're so vaccinated and we've been doing so much work and testing that, you know, I thought we might be immune, but the bottom line of that is that that's a very serious concern that we all should have uh, because that's as high as it was back in November, you know, in all of these rates uh, with the less dangerous uh, variation of COVID. Yeah. I think I just had one more slide if I go there. Oops. Um, so Tony just referenced the CDC transmission levels. This is the metric that CDC uses. And um, so the CDC guidance for K to 12 schools is universal masking sort of period, regardless of transmission levels, but their, um, their guidance in, you know, in the rest of the world um, is tied to transmission levels. And so their recommendation is that, um, that people, uh, regardless of vaccination status, mask if community transmission is either in orange or red here, substantial or high. Um, and when we first started talking about some of these issues back in July, Norfolk County was in moderate. Um, but at, at some point, I think maybe the third week of July, it flipped into substantial, which is where we are today. And I, so I think that is what you asked for. I think that's what I've got. Thanks, Emily. Does anyone have any questions on the slides? Nope. Okay. Um, so I, I do have a question in general. Do we know what communities that are local-ish to us, um, if any, have, have come out and said regarding their fall masking policies? Um, yeah, I do know some things. So I would say that there are a lot of communities that are about where we are in the timeline. A lot of school communities committees that are meeting this week, I know from my, my colleagues, um, but several districts have already made decisions. Um, all of the ones that I know about have decided to start the year with universal masking. So those um, are Canton, Framingham, Natick, Norwood, Sharon, Lexington, Arlington, Weston, Burlington, and Belmont. And uh, and a lot of cities too, but I didn't include them in, in the list. Um, and then there, are, as I said, there are a lot of school committees that are meeting this week. And I, I do know that some of those communities have boards of health that have made recommendations to the school committees. So though they haven't voted yet, they have the recommendation of their board of health. And um, I was on a meeting with about 20 superintendents earlier. So it, all, all of those folks who have recommendations from their boards of health, the recommendation is to start the year with universal masking. Um, there's a lot of conversation about revisiting the issue in early October. Emily, so that's, that's anecdotal. That's what I'm hearing. So are we gonna uh, have some, oh, let's go ahead, Chuck. Quick, quick. Are there other communities have, who have a requirement that all teachers and or all students be vaccinated before they come back? Have any towns done that? So that I am not aware of. There is one district that I think has, has officially sort of publicly mandated vaccines for staff or required testing, but I, I am not aware of a district that has mandated vaccines. And is there any movement? We now have nine tests that have to be taken, uh, nine vaccinations to go to school. Kids have to have that before they can get into school. That's these are measles, measles and mumps and polio and all that. Is there any talk about moving in that direction that you hear from the state level, or whatever? Uh, 640,000 people have died of this already. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a requirement. It's been there for a long time. Uh, and I'm just interested in anyone talking about doing uh, much, you know, uh, at the state law level. So you, you got to be vaccinated 
to come back to school. Mm -hmm. So I, I have not heard that yet, Charlie, and um, I don't know where that conversation will go as a matter of public policy. As you say, there are a number of vaccinations that are required for school entrance. Um, you know, I think the fact that 12 and under is ineligible still. And my understanding is that the FDA vaccine approval, I, I think is still an emergency status. Yeah, I think it's true? still emergency. Yeah. So I have a feeling that that may factor into the discussion. Um, so I think we'll have to see how that unfolds. Thank you. Yeah. And I think full authorization is expected in actually September for Pfizer. Yeah. Okay. So I think just to be clear and sort of set the table here, we've really talked about three pieces of guidance. Um, Three main pieces, I should say. There's a lot of studies out there, but the first is um, the CDC, which has come out and said universal masking in schools, regardless of vaccination status. Is that right? They have, and um, in sub in communities with substantial or high transmission rates. Well, actually, the the CDC guidance around K to 12 schools is not tied to transmission rate. They have just recommended it. Period. Okay. And, and they specifically, if you read the guidance, they specifically reference um, Delta, actually. I mean, they say like, do, quote, due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, right? So, so they, they're recommending universal masking. They cite that. Um, the CDC's recommendation about indoor mask use in public tied to transmission rates is for everyone. Okay, so world, schools right? <laughs> is not tied to transmission rates. They, the CDC did not, no. Okay. Um, so that's the CDC. And then there's the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which a lot of people in public comment uh, referenced. And they also advise masking in all grades, regardless of vaccination status. And then there's the DESE mass DPH guidance. And they recommend masking for pre-K to six and for unvaccinated students and staff. Um, and they also say that vaccinated students and staff who want to wear a mask should be supported in that choice. Um, and they say that all students and staff must wear masks in school health offices. That's the other thing they say. I, I would say, by the way, that there's a federal mandate that masks have to be worn on buses by all students and staff. So that's, that's just a given. Um, so what we're talking about inside school buildings here. Okay, and so those are sort of the three major pieces of guidance that, that we have that we've been looking at. I just wanted to, yeah. to sort of get that on the record, if you will. And then of course we have the COVID advisory team recommendation and- um, Yeah. Okay. And I, and I would just say that those three different pieces of guidance, I mean, I, just to be clear, all three of them say having kids in person is the most right. important, right? right. So there, I, mean, I will that. concede that yeah. from my Every, perspective. Everybody <laughs> agrees that. And then I would say the other thing that they all agree on is that there should be layered mitigation strategies, right? So they all, they all have other things to say. So when I say here are the distinctions, I'm just pulling out the part on masking, right? right. Those guidance documents have a lot in them other than yep. that. But okay, this, that's helpful. This is the piece on masking, and that's because that's where there is some um, some disagreement. Okay. So can I, Maya? Can I kick off the discussion? Please. I got to tell you, I was squirming in my seat a little bit during public participation. Um, I've thought a lot on this issue. I've read the guidance. Um, I appreciate the public participation. Um, I appreciate listening to our, you know, our own doctor and so forth. And I would say that um, at this point, I am in favor of universal masking. We spent a lot of time last year, um, you know, working to bring our kids back and we're able to do that. Now let's work to keep them here um, without, with limited interruption. And, um, you know, we have a responsibility as a school committee, as an administration to the entire district, to every kid in the district and to do everything we can to keep every kid in the district safe. And, you know, we, we all know that we have kids in our district who are medically vulnerable and we are responsible for their safety as well. We should do everything we can to keep every kid in our district safe to the best of our ability. And I want everyone to know because this is where I was squirming a little during public participation. And that is that we care about every kid in our district including those who have vulnerabilities. I want parents to know that. 
Um, I think we have to, as a school committee, take every measure um, we can to protect the students, our staff, and our faculty. And, you know, it was concerning too, somebody brought up the number of public participation about 378 kids died from COVID. To me, 378 kids dying from COVID is 378 too many. If we can do everything we can as a district to protect our kids, I think we as a school committee have to do it. And I know we're all tired of masks, every single one of us, but this is not, we're not tattooing the masks on. This is a, a temporary fix. This is until the numbers, till, till we're comfortable. We will be looking at, at the data we will be reviewing this regularly, I expect, as a committee, right? And um, we're not telling people that this is the end. This is it for the entire school year. Let's start off right. Um, let's follow the guidance. Uh, let's listen to the docs. And let's keep our kids safe. And the other thing, one thing that people didn't bring up, too, is, um, you know, that I think most people are in agreement. Well, and there was some disagreement. But, you know, the unvaccinated should be masked. But we, all, we also know that the vaccinated um, can contract the virus and spread the virus. What about the families who have kids that are you know, in the high school and in the elementary school? What about the, kid, the high school kids if they're not wearing the mask? And granted, they could contract it elsewhere, but let's not have them contract it in the school and bring it to, the, to their elementary siblings. I, you know, it's just another thought. I, I, it, it's a tough issue. And, you know, originally way back when I was thinking, you know, K to six, but, um, but I think we would re be remiss in our obligation to our district if we don't start out with universal masking. And now I feel better because again, I was really squirming and I, and I, I had to get that off my chest, so. Thank you, Carol. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I completely agree with you and felt um, the same way during public comment. Um, so I won't reiterate everything you said, but I think it was Dr. Assad who had said that, you know, one really sick kid just isn't enough and I, or isn't okay. I completely agree with that. Um, and the notion that, you know, only pre-existing um, children with pre-existing conditions die from COVID. I'm not even sure if that's true, but if it is true, uh, that is still really problematic. Um, one of Westwood's strengths is that we are able to keep our medically complex students in the district. Um, so to your point, we need to protect them. And I would think that if we went to any student in the district and said, you know what, the reason you're wearing this mask is because, you know, we wouldn't point out the classmate, but they might have a sense of which classmates are more vulnerable is to protect them. They would do it without hesitation. Um, so I support universal masking. Like you said, my stance has kind of changed over time, but um, I think the medical professionals overwhelmingly, you know, are in support of it. So, so I have to use um, their judgment in, in, in place of my own. Thanks. Okay. And Charlie, Tony? Well, I, uh, thank you. I, it's been a, a difficult year for all of us. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed working with the committee, <laughs> you know, in a strange way, dealing with an unusual situation none of us ever expected. Uh, I want to thank Tony and the committee that he's been working with for all of their input, and Emily and the staff, you know, besides the daily things they have to deal with to take this on, the staff that you put together to do testing and, and, and then all of the people doing the, the follow-up, you know, contact tracing. It's been an incredible community effort to get us to the point where we're in pretty good shape. You know, if you look at the statistics, there's probably nobody better off with people getting vaccinated than the rest. Uh, but I do think we're in the beginning of another, another beginning uh, and we don't know what's gonna happen. We can't. We can change our minds, you know. But I'd rather not have to change it because we made a mistake. And I think this, uh, the idea and the, the need uh, to do universal testing, I don't think there's another option. Now, can we change our mind in a couple of months? Sure. But you know, all along, the great thing about this committee is we've been concerned about safety, the safety of our kids, and getting everybody back to the worthwhile education in school. That's been the driving force. We haven't been able to do it in many cases. Safety won out or something else. So I think uh, I'd strongly recommend, uh, and we're not going to lock it in place forever, but we will look at as, as things go on uh, and we're watching the data because it's, but it's a very dangerous time, uh, almost as dangerous as uh, 
last year with this new variation coming down the pike. So I, I strongly support us asking for universal masking. Uh, I respect the people who have a different opinion uh, and hopefully someday we'll be back where we won't need the masks. But, uh, but I do wanna thank everybody for all the participation from so many people and so many uh, efforts made to, uh, to get to the point where we are now. Thank you, Charlie. Tony? Yeah, um, so I won't add too much. So I'm support of starting the year in universal masking. Though I do propose, similar to what we heard from the medical advisory at the September 9th meeting, we have a conversation about setting up metrics um, that would actually, you know, the, the good, I mean, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. The good or bad thing about a mask policy is you can actually turn it on and off pretty easily. It's not like you have to <laughs> rejigger. So I, do, I don't want this committee to get into changing the, the goalposts two months from now. I'd like to set those goalposts for what it looks like when we can actually get past, you know, this. So I think that would be kind of my addition that we talk about those at the September 9th meeting. Um, because like I said, I don't, I want, I don't want to be here five years um, when I've got gray hair talking about mass. So I think it'd be helpful. Actually, I think it'd make it easier in this committee if we actually, um, maybe Emily wants to be, but, um, <laughs> but that's a joke. <laughs> no, um, the, but that, that, that joking aside, um, I'd like to kind of set up something, you know, where we can actually, you know, make it a little easier on all of us. So we're not kind of talking about this every month. If we have some more, got, you know, goalposts, it actually will make it easier on us. We can spend our time on, quite frankly, a lot more and a lot of other things that we, we need to be spending our time on. Yeah, I think one one piece of, of guidance that we didn't mention is the Westwood Board of Health. Um, I think many of you got that email last week. I think it was last week. Um, where the Board of Health in the town of Westwood has recommended indoor masking regardless of vaccination status due to the Delta variant and the increase in cases that the Westwood Board of Health has seen. Um, I think we can extrapolate that, that the recommendation would apply to schools. Um, so that is one other piece of guidance that we didn't talk about. You know, this is, this is tough, I think, for all of us because I think you know, five, six weeks ago, we were like, oh, we're cruising into summer and this is great. And you can just talk about normal things. Um, in fact, this was supposed to be a um, only if we need it meeting. And I don't think any of us anticipated being here again uh, a year later, but here we are. You know, we have a current mask policy in place. And so the question is, do we want to um, reduce that policy? And, and for lack of a better word, I can't think of a better word. Um, and I, I am, I'm agreeing with everybody else. I think the current policy should stay, but I also agree with Tony that we need um, metrics and we need to be very proactive about getting those metrics to figure out, you know, when can we pivot? Um, because, you know, we're in an uptick. We saw that, we saw the charts, we have all the data, we're definitely in an uptick. Um, and that fact that we're the same, as we were in November when no one was vaccinated and now we're seeing the same case rate where we have a vast majority of, of the, the population vaccinated is, is problematic to me. Um, I also echo Carol's points about families as I'm one of them who has kids who are vaccinated and kids who aren't vaccinated and sort of the danger of bringing the, you know, the virus to the unvaccinated children. So I think for all of these reasons, I'm not saying anything new. Um, I would agree with maintaining our current policy, but again, looking at it at the September 9th meeting, um, coming up with some metrics, working hard between now and then to come up with metrics if we can, uh, maybe hopefully Desi might even weigh in on this. There's some chatter that that might happen. Um, so I think at this point, hearing the consensus on this and that there is no change to the policy. I don't think we have to take a vote. I think we just kind of continue on as we are um, enforcing masks indoors for all students, um, but really making sure that this is certainly an agenda item on the September 9th meeting, and if necessary, in the October meeting and the November meeting, um, and really looking at this and looking at the numbers and, and, and hoping, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful the vaccination clinic will help. I'm just hopeful that we can kind of get through this rough patch. And as Tony said, you know, it's pretty easy to take off a mask. So um, it's, so I think that's where we are. I don't know, what does everyone else think? I, I think that's where we are. I also want to just kind of as an aside, because it all plays into the safety, but I want to commend the other measures, you know, the, the test and yes. the vaccination clinic. And also 
think about all the faculty and staff who were vaccinated. And, you know, the, of course they do it for themselves and their families, but also for our, for our, um, our school community. You know, they're working hard to, to keep the community, the kids safe um, and in so many ways. And part of that is by getting vaccinated. So, um, you know, following along in that vein where, where all of these measures that we're taking, I think are commendable and, and, um, and the mask wearing is just part and parcel to the, to the program. Yep. And I don't want to feel hopeless. I mean, our kids are going to be back in school, right? So we're already so far ahead of where we were a year ago. They're going to be back in school. There's going to be circle time. They're going to have lunch, you know? So yeah, they'll be wearing masks. Um, well, not at lunch, but, you know, I think that we're already, we're not, it's not as awful as it was last year. <laughs> So I do think we have made a number of steps forward and I'm just excited that the kids can go back to doing activities and have clubs and have them in person and not have to zoom all day. So I do think that, you know, there is hope um, and there has been progress and I don't think we should forget that or, or minimize that. Um, this is one mitigation measure. I feel like we need to keep in place uh, again, it, as the, as the, as the doctor uh, public participant said, it's a risk benefit analysis and, um, I think the risk of wearing a mask is minimal compared to the benefit to our community. You know, every single kid in our, we are, we as a school committee are responsible for every single kid um, in our district. And I think we need to look out for everyone. So, all right. Is there anything further on this no, issue? Not, not on this, I just more on a communication point, I think, um, as we think, um, you know, Emily, as you think your team think about communication in the start of the school year, I think, you know, it goes without saying, I just want people to be clear, even aside from the mask policy, there are advantages to vaccination from the point of view of close contact and how we treat that from the DESI guidance. So I think, you know, I think just one more reiteration, people, I don't want people to be surprised. Who knows what the new mask policy could be months from now, but just reiterate, I don't want people to be surprised saying, oh, why are you treating unvaccinated people differently? I think just reinforcing that message. I mean, you will be, I know, but like kind of, you know, and the vaccination clinics, obviously. Um, coming up in September would be great. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point. I'll, I will um, I will be communicating something now that this meeting has happened shortly. Um, yeah, and I will make sure that people understand that by being vaccinated, that um, they wouldn't be subject to the quarantining if they were close contacts, yes. Right, and that's in effect today, right? That's with the new... Yes. Um, Right, okay. New DPH protocol, yep. Um, all right, if there isn't any, anything else, final thoughts, speak now. Nope. Okay, we are moving on to action items. Um, so our first action item is the approval of the superintendent as district representative to tech or the education collaborative. This is an annual vote of the school committee to name the superintendent as the district representative to the tech board of directors. Um, so I just need a motion. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, I'll do a roll call. Charlie? Yes. Carol? Yes. Tony? Y yes. Amanda? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Motion is carried. Um, next is approval of the meeting minutes of July 22nd, 2021. Can I get a motion? So moved. Any discussion? Nope. Okay. Uh, Charlie? Yes. Carol? Yes. Tony? Yes. Amanda? Yes. And I am yes as well. Motion is carried. And our final action item is approval of our meeting minutes from August 2nd, 2021. Um, can I get a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Okay, Charlie? Yes. Carol? Yes. Tony? Yes. Amanda? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Motion is carried. Is there any new business that anyone wants to raise at this time? Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Charlie? Yes. <laughs> Carol? Yes. Tony? Yes. Amanda? Yes. And I am a yes as well. 
Okay, thank you everyone. Hard conversations, hard decisions, but as always, I appreciate your time. Um, maybe we can get back to the last few weeks of summer and uh, see everyone in September.